Good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, before we get started, I think Brace is going to lead us in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We're thankful for the sunshine this morning, for the sunshine we enjoyed yesterday, and for <clears throat> all the ways that you bless us in this life. We're thankful for the beauties of the world that you've made that we can look at and enjoy, and uh, even the wonders that we can look at as we watch the weather and see some of the unbelievable things that happen in the world uh, that are the result of weather patterns. We recognize your greatness and your power and recognize that you are <clears throat> above all those things and that uh, you have all power and can help us in the midst of our struggles and can give us hope. And we're thankful for all that you do for us to provide for our needs daily and pray that we recognize how much we depend on you and everything that we are and in all that we have and that we use those things as good stewards, that we use them to your glory and honor, that we share them with those who are less fortunate and that we look for opportunities to do good in your name so that you can be glorified through us. We're thankful most of all though for your love and mercy and for your faithfulness. We're thankful for the forgiveness of sins through Christ and for the hope that that provides. <clears throat> and pray that that hope is a motivation for us as we live here, that we uh, arise each morning with the recognition of that hope and that we seek to use the day to bring glory to you. As we face trials and struggles, we pray that that hope is ever before us to to keep us pressing on, doing the, doing what we may be able to do in the midst of those struggles, again, to bring glory to you, and perhaps to lead others to know you through those trials and difficulties that we face. May we not face the struggles and trials of this world and the losses that we experience with uh, the same attitudes as those around us. May we always uh, have that hope before us so that we live differently and and that we might uh, use those opportunities as we do so for for good and not only our good but for the good of those who are around us we pray father for those who are struggling now in the midst of this group uh, those who are continuing to battle cancer allison and jenny and the struggles that they face as they go through their treatments and pray that you would be with each of them and give them strength, give strength to their families as they uh, are by their side to care for them and help them and pray that we would uh, use opportunities to help them in whatever ways that we can to encourage them, to lift them up and to help them in the midst of their trial. We pray for those who have <clears throat> continual difficulties and illnesses that they're battling against. We continually pray for Jim and Audra and for Gail and Ann and Ken and Arlene and Jean and Faye. And we continue, continue to pray for Jerry Drake and Dale Sovereign and Pauline Engel and uh, pray for others who have <clears throat> pains that they face uh, daily, the struggles that they go through, that you'd give each of them strength for the day that they might use that day and find opportunities to bring glory to you in the midst of their struggles. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be with Terry Graham and his recovery and <clears throat> that you would help that to go smoothly and pray that you would be with each of us as members here, that we continue to grow in our relationships with not only you but with one another in ways that would be good for us and would bring glory to you and might allow this uh, allow us as a congregation to shine as a light for this community so that we might lead others to know you. We pray for our shepherds as they lead here in this place. That you give them wisdom and strength and patience to do that in a way that would be to your glory and our good. And pray for <clears throat> the deacons as they serve here and continue to pray for John and his family as they work here with us as they are a part of the group here that you give him wisdom as he continues to preach your word yeah. 
continue to help him to grow in all the ways that uh, he is striving to uh, so that he can be an example and so that he can continue to teach in ways that will be beneficial for us. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with each family here, give us strength to honor you before our children, to lead them to know you and to love you, and to grow to serve you in the ways that they should, so that we might all enjoy uh, an eternity with you when this life is over. We pray for your forgiveness for the times that we fail you and sin against your name. Pray for your help as we battle against temptations. We pray, Father, that you'd be with us as we study your word this morning and pray that we continue to learn the valuable lessons left for us in the book of Ephesians by your spirit. Pray that you would be with Jeff as he leads the class here. Be with each of us as students that we would look to your word for the wisdom and guidance that we need to be the people you've called us to be. We pray all these things and ask all these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brace. Okay, this morning we're going to be starting in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, and I, I want to go over just a couple of things before we, uh, we start this morning in Ephesians 2. I came across some old notes yesterday as I was studying um, and thought they'd be especially helpful as we look at what we're looking at this semester, as we look at Ephesians and Philippians uh, and Colossians. But any Bible study, I, I think these are good good ideas to keep in mind. Three things. What is happening? What, what has God done for us? What has Christ done for us? What has the Holy Spirit done for us? And we saw that in uh, chapter 1, and we're going to see that kind of sprinkled throughout uh, the book of Ephesians, where it talks about what each one of them, each one of the Godhead has done for us. But what is happening? So what? What are the implications there? Um, you know, we kind of see the so what in chapters 1 through 3, and then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, the now what? Uh, what are the applications for me? But what is happening, so what, and now what? So just some easy ways to remember as, as we study the Scriptures here. And as we start our study in chapter, uh, chapter 2, just kind of want to go back and just remind everybody real briefly about all these blessings that we see, the grace that God has bestowed upon us, and all these different blessings that we looked at in chapter 1 have to do with being in Christ. Uh, and then as we look at just a real brief outline of what we looked at in chapter 1, the blessings from the Father, how He's chosen us, how He's adopted us, how He's accepted us, the blessings from the Son, how He has redeemed us, and we've been forgiven because of what He's done for us, and then the blessings from the Spirit, uh, how He sealed us, and how He's given as an earnest, or He's given us an earnest. And then just very briefly, in Ephesians 2, this is what we're going to be looking at. We are raised and seated with Him, what we were, what God did for us, and what we are now. And we are reconciled in members of God's house, what the Gentiles were, what God did, and what the Gentiles and Jews now together are. Um, let me go back here. Now this, this great mystery that Paul keeps talking about, uh, we're going to be looking at that in Ephesians 2, but before we get started, I want to just ask, what was the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles at, at this point? What, what, what did the Jews think of the Gentiles and what did the Gentiles think of the Jews? I mean, not, not just particularly at this time period in Ephesians, but, but farther back. Huge amount of animosity, a huge amount of hostility between the two groups. Uh, and, and I put this relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. This is kind of what the Jews thought. The Gentiles were assumed to be morally deficient, impure, decadent, and sinful. 
They believed the Gentiles were heathens and pagans. The Israelites had a strong nationalistic pride, uh, continually in battle with the Gentiles. And Rome had been very oppressive to the, to the Israelites. Um, and then what the Greeks thought, many Greeks and Romans looked down on the Jewish customs. They thought the Sabbath was a sign of laziness and often criticized Jews as lazy. They thought that circumcision was barbaric. They thought Jewish dietary laws were ridiculous and antisocial, and they accused the Jews of separatism and unsociability. So you can see there, you know, with, with what they thought of each other, how much hostility uh, there was between the two groups. Uh, and, and one of the things I want to do this morning, and it's, it's a rather lengthy reading, but what I'd like to do is go back to Acts and read just a little bit to kind of set the backstage for what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, so if, if everyone could turn to uh, back to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10. And I need three people to read this morning, if you would. And you might as well raise your hand because if you don't, I'm going to be... Jim's one. Jim, if you would read Acts 10, 1 through 23. Ashley... 24 through 48, and then one other. Oh, Andrew, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, <laughs> 1 through 18, if you would. But, but starting out, Acts 10, 1 through 23, <clears throat> setting the backstage. Now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. <clears throat> About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in to him and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze upon him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, <clears throat> who is called, also called Peter. He is staying with a certain tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when the angel who saw who was speaking to him had departed, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were in constant attendance upon him. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he beheld the sky opened up, and a certain object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again a voice came to him a second time, What God hath cleansed no longer consider unclean. And this happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, <clears throat> now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but arise, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgiving, for I have sent them myself. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message 
from you. And so he invited them in and gave them lodging. Yes, please. And on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of them, or and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with them, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner, foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I asked for what reason you have sent for me. <clears throat> Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come here. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent through the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know that the things which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed, you know of Jesus of, Naz of Nazareth, how God appointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all things, he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted uh, that he become visible, not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that he is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Thank you, Ashley. Andrew. Now when the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God, or they did hear, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up into heaven again. And behold, at that very moment three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent, from me, sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa, and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. 
As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gives to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Thank you, Andrew. Praise God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. So, and I know that was a lengthy reading, but I think it's important to look at that as we start into chapter 2 here. So, like I say, kind of set the stage for what we're going to be looking at. Um, and as we, we get into the chapter, I want to look at just a couple of real quick parallel passages um, to what we were like before we were in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 talks a little bit about that. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor strand, slanders, nor swindlers, the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. And then Titus 3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We hated and hating one another. And now as we get into Ephesians chapter 2 here. Now what I want to do as we read this, I want us to use I, substitute the word I for the pronouns in this passage here. As for me, I was dead in my transgressions and sins in which I used to live when I followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. I also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. I was by nature an object of wrath. But that first question there, the handout. What do verses 1 through 3 tell us about our former lives and the condition we were in? What's that first couple of passages in Ephesians chapter 2 tell us? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, it doesn't say we were kind of sick and we needed resuscitation. It's not that we had a cold or a little bit of a fever. We were dead. We were flatlined. Uh, and we needed resurrection. We needed a new life. Does anybody... There was a movie out, and it's, it's been years and years ago, uh, by Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis was in it. And it was called The Sixth Sense. And in that movie, The Sixth Sense, there was a little boy that said, I can see things that other people can't see. I can see dead people walking around, and they don't know they're dead. And that's true today. There's a lot of people walking around spiritually dead, and they don't know they're dead. And that's why it's important for us to share what we're learning about here, to share the good news with them, because they don't know they're dead. We were dead. Praise be to God for what he did for us. And now we need to share again. We need to share that good news with others. But we were dead in our transgressions and sin in which we used to live. What is meant that we were by nature children of wrath? Ash? 
Opposition to God? Yeah. Well, by nature, um, I think they mean here like second nature by practice. Yeah. And the wrath, it's talking about God's wrath. And if you look at Romans one eighteen, it talks about um, you know, God's righteous judgment and he's a holy God. He hates sin and has to punish it. Yep. Exactly. Nature refers to one's acquired nature through habitual, regular practice. Their nature is their character. Um, I think when it talks about kind of similar to this, when it talks about in 1 John, walking in darkness versus walking in the light, that walking is, is the natural, what that person, you know, is, is uh, his habitual, regular practice is to walk in darkness. And walking in light is that habitual, regular practice of walking in the light. And like 1 John talks about, you know, if we stumble and we're in Christ, we have that advocate. We have that forgiveness of sins. But um, kind of like that, the quality that makes something what it is, the essential character of a thing is, is what the nature is. So, anyone else? But Paul, as he starts out chapter 2 here, Paul wants the Ephesians to see the horrible nature of sin and, and the consequences and, and from what they've been delivered, you know, from. And they have to realize how awful that condition is before they can realize the beauty of the grace of God and the forgiveness of sins. So he starts out with, this is where you were, but God. Again, Joy? <clears throat> In answering what you were... Um, talking about with um, um, by nature, I was reading somebody who said um, that we we chose ourself. We had self aimed choices rather than God aimed choices, and our natural inclination um, was to our own appetites rather than to God's. Um, uh, we we desired to fulfill these desires of the flesh naturally, um, but we were not made to by God. Um, so it's kind of a self-centered initially, or or like a kid, you know, when they're born, they're um, they're they're about themselves, and they're taught then to not be that way. Right, and that's that's kind of what verse three there is talking. I want what I want when I want it how I want it, you know, so it's all the, um, about self here. Brace. Oh. I do think it's important to at least acknowledge that the word by nature or phrase by nature could be used two different ways. And we are by nature bipeds. I mean, that's the way we were created. Um, evolutionarily, if you if were to believe in that, you do believe that's how we evolved. But I mean, people are by nature bipeds. It's not really a choice we make. It's just how we are. Right. So I think it's important to at least acknowledge that by nature can mean that. Um, clearly, from a biblical point of view, we are not by nature objects of wrath because we are objects of love. Um, so there are multiple passages that make it clear that this passage by nature is a reference to, as you've said, our, our practice. What's, what's become, as Ashley said, second nature to us because we've practiced it for so long. But uh, I do think it's important to at least acknowledge that by nature can refer to how we, just how we are. I mean, sometimes people say, well, it's human nature. Well, is, is human nature, uh, the, the old debate, is it nature or nurture, um, is, uh, again, the, the way we use nature there is, is it human nature because that's the way we were made, that's the way we were created, or is it human nature because that's the behavior we've learned and practiced? So in and, this passage, it's clear. Right. But how do some interpret this passage? Some will right. interpret it that we are, we're people 
And so by the very nature of the fact that we are descendants of Adam, we've inherited his sin. And we are by nature, by, by the fact that we are his descendants, we are automatically sinful. Right. But sin is a choice. Um, it's, a, it's a willful choice to do that which is displeasing to God. Now, we have natural tendencies. We get hungry, we eat food. The flesh has natural tendencies. Um, and the reality is the flesh wants what it wants. If we get hungry, we want food. Um, we, we want pleasure. We want all kinds of things in our flesh. But none of those things have to be fulfilled in a sinful way. Those are choices. Right. So God always provides a means by which we can satisfy the sin, the, the, we, the, we can satisfy the nature of our flesh and its cravings and desires in a way that is within his will. Within his will and still glorifying. Correct. And so we've got to recognize that, I mean, there, there are both aspects of that. But clearly in this passage, like I said, from a biblical point of view, it's clear we are not objects of wrath because of the way we were made. We were fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist says. Uh, we were created in the image of God, Genesis says. So, I mean, and everything about God's desire for us is that we are objects of his love and mercy and compassion. So we are only objects of wrath because we of have by practice chosen yeah. to sin. Yeah. And God, as a righteous God, as Ashley said, must punish that yeah. because he's just. Yeah, and, and especially what we looked at in, from what you were saying about objects of his love, well, we're going to get into that in just a little bit, the but God, but especially in Ephesians chapter 1, what we learned about all that he did for us in love. So we are definitely objects of his love. Andrew? I, I do have a question about that because the way I looked at being by nature children of wrath, I would make the argument that that there is an element of instinct or I wouldn't say a created nature, but an instinctual nature that few of us get out of prior to learning it. Um, and, and here's what I mean by that. I think maybe too, it comes from dis distinguishing what we mean by children of wrath. Are we saying sinful or are we saying inclined to a certain way of thinking? Um, I certainly wouldn't say that any of us are created inherently sinful. The natural body, the natural self is not made sinful and it, and it is not inherently sinful. But I think that our, our first instinctual state is, um, is selfishness and is self-preservation even at the cost of others. And it seems like that's, I, I don't know of any person here who would say that's not how they first learned really as children and, and as individuals, if not for instruction otherwise, I don't know that anyone would be something other than children of wrath to use the, the term there and maybe just to say instinctually, instinctually selfish or inclined to react emotionally to perceived threats. I agree. Um, that's kind of what I see when I, when I look at children of wrath. And so it's, I don't think I'm disagreeing with Brace, but I'm, I'm interested in the distinction. You know, is there, is there an inherent instinctual element that in this passage it's saying, look, if you're not learning otherwise, it needs to be overcome because without other instruction, this is how we are. Not sinful by nature, but inclined to be selfish and to tend toward that by nature. I don't know. There's a lot of um, terms to get hung up on. Greg. So Grace is right and, and, and Andrew's right. Andrew's right. right. Of course. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and the way to reconcile that is, is simply this. When we're dealing with the natural man, the natural man is an absence of the spiritual man, the spiritual self. We perceive and we watch as young babies grow, they are in a state where the natural man has the preeminence in their behavior patterns, in their crying when they're wet and when they're hungry and all these things. And they are not, they are not incorporating the spiritual nature of that undeveloped self at that point. And, and I think... Uh, to Paul's point, he talks about you were 
children of disobedience. There is a natural man that is just absent a spiritual person. And until that spiritual person is um, awakened and, and informed and then begins to make choices that override the, the natural or the, um, the physical uh, manifestations of self in, in your personality, uh, you'll never get beyond the stage of being a, a spoiled baby. Uh, all babies are spoiled, and that's the way we want them. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have any other child but one that is just uh, I- existing to eat and burp and have their diaper changed. But, but in that analysis, in that comparison, um, we also understand there's no reasonable person that believes someone should remain in that state their entire lives, but that the natural self comes under the control and under the, uh, and becomes submitted to the spiritual part of man. And, and that awakening has to occur in every one of us. And, and it's a simple acknowledgement. We all know we were once in that state. Now, how long did we stay in that state? Was there no spiritual awakening in us until we were 80 year old, until we were 50, until we were 30? And that's, that's a question. I depends on the person, but, it, but in each instance, I think, uh, we still have to acknowledge that the, the, um, the physical manifestations of our personhood focus on our bodies before they focus on our spirit. And we have to grow and we have to learn and we have to seek that which is higher than just pleasures of the flesh. Yeah, and isn't that, isn't that what... Uh, First Corinthians chapter two talks about the natural man, and the, he can't understand the spiritual things because, again, he hasn't been learned of. You know, just he's instinctive. I'm going to please the flesh. And it, as we look at that and trying to get people, again, what what you said about our natural instincts, and coming to that realization of of our spiritual selves. How important is that for us to help people become aware of that? And I I know I keep going back to that, but we just have a huge responsibility in sharing the good news and making people aware of their current state and what their state can be like. Grace? I agree. I agree with it, Andrew and Greg. And I think Greg <clears throat> helps to point out that, um, I mean, it is, it is because of our flesh, and the spiritual man hasn't been awakened yet. But one of the points that I would make that I think is pretty clear in Again, the overall context of Scripture is, I mean, while children may be naturally selfish until they learn otherwise, the selfishness of a child is not an object of God's wrath because a child doesn't understand. Um, A child seeking to fulfill its hunger because it's hungry. Um, The nature, uh, by nature, objects of wrath in this context and scriptural context is we've made a choice that has put us in that place. And so at some point we all become accountable for the selfish choices that we make. <clears throat> and whether we learned better from our parents or from other people who influenced us in our lives beforehand or not, at some point becomes irrelevant. Every human being, man or woman, is accountable before God. <clears throat> And continuing to live according to the flesh becomes ex- unacceptable at some point, and we become nature by object or by nature objects of wrath. Now, as Greg said, when is that? It, there, there may be people who never reach that point that God considers them accountable because of their inability to understand the nature of the, those things. I don't know. It may be that some people reach that point earlier in life and some later in life. I don't know. But at some point, 
each of us makes a choice to sin against God. And I don't think it's a, oh, look at that. You knew better and you did it anyway, and you're now going to hell uh, any more than I think that's the case for a Christian. But when we make it a practice to do that which is displeasing to God, we by, we come by our nature objects of wrath. Now, that, that again, I'm not disagreeing with Andrew. I mean, it may be that we just are giving in to the natural fleshly desires that are inherent in being in the body and not living according to the spiritual man, but we have made those choices. At some point, we, we decided, this is how I'm living. And so we, by our choice, become objects of God's wrath. And we need God's love and mercy that we're going to talk about in the latter part of this text. Yeah. I think Jim has something. Uh, <clears throat> for those of us who are a little bit older, we remember a uh, comedian comic that uh, would, Flip would have Wilson. a little act, Flip Wilson, and and he would do the Charlene thing, and he and he'd say she'd just say, "Yeah, the devil made me do it," and that you know that's covers both sides. It, it's it's a fact that that there's knowledge that what we're doing is in in conflict with what God wants us to do. And there's full knowledge that we're, we're looking for a scapegoat to uh, not hold us responsible, uh, that there's outside influences that's causing us to do things wrong. It's like Adam. She made me. All right. First, everybody, thanks for um, developing this um, scripture for me better. Um, in uh, listening to, um, we were talking about, I think it was Brace talking about um, babies. Um, well, if you've ever been around, and them not being, what do you call them, objects of wrath, um, the same thing applies to um, those who truly are mentally handicapped. They can be 17, they can be 30. Or 65. I, or 65. <laughs> but I was just thinking about, um, you know, there's a few at Lakeview that um, if you <laughs> uh, spend much time with them, there is just absolutely no way to, to believe in any way they are objects of wrath. There is no way, and you know they're they're getting older, and um, and it's just that uh, capacity is never going to be there, to the level that it is. You know, there's going to be you know di differing between every single person, but um, those to me are kind of um, the sweet, absolutely totally innocent, um, going to heaven. You know, there's their ticket stamped. You know. They, they are not making choices and are not capable of making choices to uh, be objects of wrath. Well, as we end up here today, we're going to start with Ephesians 2, verses 4, that but God. And, and kind of keep in mind that God is in the business of bringing dead things to life. So think about that as...